All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you once again for joining Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC show. You know, refrigerant transitions really are not new to the industry. In fact, many of us, some of us gray hair technicians, we're actually on our third refrigerant transition, right? We had a CFC phase out. We had an HCFC phase out, and we have now entered into an HFC phase down. If you weren't aware, we've already begun this transition. And so we have a lot of things to talk about going forward. So today we're spending some quality time with our knowledge partners over at Honeywell. How are you guys doing today? Great, Clifton. How are you? I'm doing well. So we're spending time with Ron Vogel and Doug Starsenich from Honeywell, and we're going to talk about things that are transitioning into new perspectives for the industry, right? Many of us have to learn a little bit about A2L refrigerants in particular and to get comfortable with what this transition looks like. So thanks so much for joining us today, guys. And let's talk a little bit about how you have been through these transitions in the past and the refrigerant transitions that you have seen. Well, sure, I'll start, Doug. Well, you can tell by the gray hair that I've been around for a good period of time. I've got uh, a little over 40 years invested in this industry, basically my entire working career. And as you said, we went through the first of the CFC transitions, right? And then the phase down and the HF, you know, HCFCs. And now we're embarking on a, uh, you know, a, 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 a new a new level, so to speak, right? Um, as the GWP uh, is cranked down, uh, we need to come up with solutions. And um, that's where we are. And the, they're just about upon us right now. So this will be an interesting journey. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're having a little bit of problems with Doug popping in. I'm sure he'll be back here in just a second. And mm -hmm. while we're doing that, everyone, let us know where you're joining in from, right? We are all from different places of the industry, different areas of the country and different areas of the world. And as the HVACR community, we're here to support each other so that everyone can get through this transition being mm -hmm. more prepared and more educated. So let us know in the chat where you're chiming in from. I'm here in Brownsburg, Indiana. Jason, where are you at? I am in Crown Point, Indiana. Fantastic. We see people hopping in all over the place. And where are you joining us today from, Ron? Buffalo, New York. Very cool. Well, let's hop in. We'll give a little bit of time for uh, for Doug to pop back in here with us. I see him coming through in the background. There he is. So <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Thanks, back Doug. Back. <laughs> back up and running. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, let's hop in here. We have so many things to talk about and we have, uh, you know, we're probably gonna be an hour. We may end up going past that, but we want you to hang in so that no matter what, even by the time we get to that one hour mark, we're gonna give you a code that'll get you access into a free opportunity to take the ESCO Low GWP Safety Training Course. It's being sponsored by Honeywell for you as a bonus for participating with us. So make sure to stay on to the end and we'll get you that code for sure. All right, well, let's dive into this and let's learn a little bit more about this A2L transition, Ron. You bet. Um, thanks, Clifton. Appreciate the uh, the opportunity. And you can go on to the next slide, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start with regulations, right? Any major change that we've had in our industry was really driven by uh, regulations. So we'll, we'll, we'll jump into them. And I'm looking at, I'm still looking at the cover slide, but. Yep, I got to get over here real quick. Give me just a second. Right. That's on me this time. That's okay. Um, so as, as we wait for the slide to come up, uh, you know, the EPA in, in the United States uh, up until this AIM Act did not have the ability to regulate on GWP, so to speak, climate change, et cetera. So uh, once uh, this came into act in um, 2020, uh, the EPA now has legal authority to regulate on global warming. And, this AIM Act has, you know, three components to it, mm -hmm. um, really, uh, regulation or phase, uh, the ability to control how much we manufacture or import. Um, it gives the, them the ability to regulate on sector specific. In other words, they can pick a sector and either eliminate it, uh, a refrigerant that's currently being used, or put GWP values in place. Sure. And then, and then lastly, um, they need to come up with some rules to increase the amount of reclaim uh, and yep, reduce biggie. leaks in existing systems, right? Yeah, that's a that's a big thing. So, um, really, three three uh, key elements to this this bill, and we'll we'll touch a, a little bit on each each one of them in, in the next couple of slides. But that yeah. is driving this reduction. Yeah, Ron, you you kind of mentioned it, but uh, 
the second point there, the sector specific, everyone might remember a couple of years ago, um, SNAP had some regulations like 404A, you couldn't use that in the supermarket. Right. Um, and then that went away because they didn't have the legal authority. Exactly um, right, Doug. So I just want everybody to know that now this is this has gone through Congress. It's been signed. It's a real thing. Uh, they do have the th authority now to regulate on global warming, not just ozone depletion. That's yeah, correct. And, and that second bullet point says technology transitions. You may have heard uh, people throw around the term TT rule. And right. uh, that, that's, that's the terminology that's being used. And we'll look at that in a, in a, in a minute here. Okay. So diving into the TT rule, um, a few facets uh, to it. Um, there are <laughs> threshold GWPs uh, being put in place. Uh, they can either partially fully or use a graduated schedule in, in each segment uh, around GWP. Um, the scope of it, of the TT rule, is really only on new, new products, new installations going forward. Uh, some people are worried that it'll affect their uh, retrofits and that sort of thing, but not not at this point. Sure. And and they also establish transition dates. So um, there, there's a number of different dates. We'll cover it in the next slide. And um, the, but the soonest is January 1, 2025, and we'll see what sector uh, you know that applies to. Yeah, but that's going to be a really big one. That's the one that most people <laughs> are preparing for, and that uh, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that today. You're you're right, Clifton, and it's um, you know, it, it may seem like it's a, a a ways down the line for some people, but if you're a manufacturer and you have to, it's a big deal to be ready. It's a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. And for those that are out here in the uh, in the community in the chat box, so Jason Objutes hanging out with us up here. Jason, how's it going? It is definitely going, Clifton. Thank you. So Jason, I am monitoring, yes. Exactly. Jason's going to be covering some of the questions coming through on the chat, and we may be able to get some at the end of the show. But uh, if you have questions along the way, put them in the chat box, and we have a whole team of people, including Jason, that's going to be here to help walk along and understand where some of those additional resources are. You bet. We appreciate it. So the phase-down portion, uh, we've already mm. seen one step in the uh, a little explanation on here. There's an allocation that's been put into place for manufacturers such as Honeywell or importers. Sure. And the, the EPA came up with these allotments, and it's based on uh, usage, uh, you know, going back, historical usage, right? And then we've been giving a bucket, so to speak. And it's not pounds of refrigerant. It is actually the CO2E equivalent of that refrigerant. So based on its global warming potential. Based on its global warming potential. And uh, uh, I know Doug's going to comment on this, but, yeah. Um, yeah. It, uh, um, you know, so we can make up to our, you know, our limit. Um, but if we make 404, Doug will give you an example. Um, it used a lot more of our allotment, right? And it's not only refrigerants. A company like Honeywell, uh, we provide, um you know, refrigerants into, so to speak, refrigerants Chemicals. into the foam blowing aspect, yeah. medical many sectors, you know, many different sectors. So We're that's all in. right. Mm -hmm. And that's all in our, uh, in our bucket. And, uh, we now have to determine, uh, you know, what we're going to manufacture, how much of what, because it, it directly, it directly affects what we can roll out. Yeah. yeah absolutely. And, and you're right, Ron, I'm going to comment that this looks pretty extreme when you get, especially when you get down to 2036, where oh, yeah. 15%. But you have to think that the, the refrigerants we're going to talk about today, the, the A2Ls, um, I give you an example, like, like Ron said, 404A's got a GWP of, of almost 4,000. So you could say we have 4,000 points when we sell that. Sure. Yeah. Um, the new refrigerants like a 455A, let's say mm -hmm. it's, it's less than 150. Mm -hmm. So as far as the quota goes, we can sell 25 times as much of that. Oh, wow. So that, that actually puts it in perspective. It's you yeah. know, based on that GWP. It really comes down to the volume of refrigerant based on GWP. On GWP. That's right. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. That's right. And you've already seen the effect. Uh, there are some manufacturers that have discontinued selling, say, 507, a high GWP product, uh, 407A, right? So yeah, what is in that? Europe, in Europe, they're not selling 404 anymore. It's done. You know? Oh, yeah. It's been out for a little bit. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And uh, so you're going to see availability of some product, high GDP products, um, you know, uh, diminish in a pretty short period of time. 
Sure. You know, you know, when we talk about all these other different sectors that have used these chemicals in the past, a lot of people don't realize that we are not the only ones using these chemicals mm -hmm. and that through all of these different refrigerant transitions, multiple industries have been affected by it as well. So we always talk about the foam blowing industries. Mm -hmm. They are all using HFCs or most of them are using yeah. HFCs right now. But mm -hmm. we've used even in the CFC phase out, we were using CFC 12 for things like hairspray propellants and insecticide propellants, you know, way back in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. Yeah. So many different industries are being impacted by it, not just us. So it's very important that everyone knows that, you know, this is a global effort to reduce our impact to global warming. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The point, Clifton, is that, that this chart you see on the right, this is part of the Kigali Amendment to the absolutely. Montreal Protocol. Montreal Protocol is the one that did the CFCs, R12 and R22. So we're we're going along with the rest of the of the globe as far as this transition. We, you know, the United States didn't make up this this. No, right? we're following right. two different things. We're following an international treaty, right. and we're following an act of Congress. So yep. good luck trying to turn either one of those around, let alone both of them. <laughs> That's right. So these are the drivers, and uh, you mentioned other options. A lot of people don't realize that R12 was in the uh, meter dose inhalers. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Up and, up until a very short period of time. Yeah. yeah this GWP, I think, is 12,800, I think, if I remember right. It's yes, way up there. Significantly up yeah, there. Way, way up there. Right. And then um, just a couple other things on here. Compliance. Um, the EPA is really all over this. Um, uh, we need to file, you know, pretty exacting paperwork and tracking. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it is going to be monitored. Um, and, and you can see the timing uh, on this next bar. The allowances have been out uh, for the 24 to 28, and then they'll do it again. And that's, that, that determines who gets who gets how much of the bucket. And, and Doug, I apologize for my tongue getting hung up on me earlier. So, <laughs> <laughs> no worries. so Doug Starsenic, so we, we would want to know a little bit more about this too. We were kind of talking about this earlier. A lot of people don't realize that we've already began that phase down. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about these steps real quick and how soon we're going to be reducing mm -hmm. these, these abilities to manufacture, uh, you know, larger quantities of high GWP refrigerants? As far as the graph here, you mean? Yeah, exactly. A lot of people yeah, don't realize I mean, what's getting ready to happen in a month. We're already down 10% um, yeah. from, uh, what's the baseline, Ron? 2013. 2013. 2013. So, you know, the 10% is more like 15 or 20, really, uh, sure. based on the, uh, 2019. And then we're going to jump jump down another 30% um, next year. January first of twenty twenty four. Yeah, and this is, the, this is the this is this is the scary year because we're dropping thirty percent. At the same time, the equipment using H two Ls is not ready. Yeah. So it's this gap year or whatever you want to call it. It's 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 going to be a, a weird year twenty twenty four when because the OEMs are struggling, you know. But you have to have leak detection and all these different things you have to be UL approved. Absolutely. Um, and they're trying really hard, but it's 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 a lot of work. So uh, it's going to be interesting here. And that's what right. we're doing. We're here to educate you on all of these transitions that we're making right now to prepare you for when they get here, because a lot of them are going to be coming pretty quickly. A lot of people don't realize we already have A2L being released in smaller systems under four pounds, typically, mm -hmm. and ones mm -hmm. that don't have mitigation. So a lot of our window units, a lot of our portable systems are already using A2L refrigerants. And make sure that you hang around to the end. Like I said, at the end of the show, we're going to give you a code to get you free access, courtesy of Honeywell, for our e-learning course. It's about a three and a half hour course that can prepare you for the 50 question assessment that goes along with it for low GWP certification. So fantastic guys. Great stuff here. Mm -hmm. This is, oof, this is one that uh, a lot of questions come in for us about these particular ones right here. Sure. And uh, uh, just a, the terminology that the EPA is um, using, you know, key terms here mm -hmm. uh, as they talk about, you know, the TT rule. It, and uh, and a phase down, but the products, uh, their terminology, that is a factory charge completed appliance, right? Sure. Factory built, factory charge. A system is a field built, installed, could be residential, light commercial, whatever, if it needs to be piped. And a component is any of the major mechanical elements, right? And these, these are their terms. And the important thing to note here is when we make this transition, there will be no sell through at this point in time for systems or components. So what that means to wholesalers, manufacturers, they've got a lot of 410 units sitting around. It cannot be sold into new uh, new build, so to speak. Yeah, field complete systems. Equipment, complete yeah. systems. 
If a home and depot it, has a refrigerator, they can sell it for I think it's a year afterwards. But, right, they're still right. too late. Uh, mm -hmm. A split system, the condenser, no, not right now. Right, but have it, you have, right. It, have, it, have it gone by the end of the year. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so that's um, that's that's an interesting uh, aspect of it, as well as the fact that components, four ten a components, can be manufactured or imported uh, for maintenance, and that's exempted. So that's that's a quandary for the industry, right? Is uh, and OEMs are transitioning over to manufacture, you know, say 454B units. Right. Um, are they going to continue to manufacture both, yeah, both, both of them? Right. Sure. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough thing. And then then it begs the question: Will there even be enough? And I, we started talking about this, say 410A, mm -hmm. <laughs> to service that based on some of these restrictions and things that are happening. Yeah, because that's going to be very important going forward is our service gas. And we'll dive deeper into that. So when sure. we start talking about those different systems, whether it is a system, whether it is a component, when we're talking about that relevance in the refrigerant going into them mm -hmm. and the compliance dates, there's a lot of things people need to be aware of, especially in our residential like commercial, but everyone. So everyone's going to be affected by this in some way or another. But the residential like commercial is the one that um, I don't think people are prepared for. Yeah. I, I think you're right. Um, here's a little bit more into the uh, sector specific. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that pretty much everything that we deal with here, or most of the things that we deal with, and it gets pretty granular. I mean, they've carved out an entire section for ice machines, right? Given it a GWP limit range, uh, what products are excluded, when, and uh, what compliant products, you know, there would be. So we look at residential like commercial, obviously 410 going to 454B, uh, VRF, chillers. And Doug made an excellent point earlier that if you look on the right side of this chart, there are very few A1 possibilities over yeah, here. Yeah, wow. Right? So yeah, we could yeah. not flammable. Yeah, there's, there's a yeah. N71. That's a new product. That's a, a low-pressure refrigerant. And and 1233ZD. And that's, as far as non-flammable, that's yeah. it. 515B and 513 as well. Yeah, that's but, true. But they're, you know, they're, they're three, you know, 300 and, um, you know, so you can't move them around a lot of these columns. Right. So, so that's why we really need to talk about A2Ls and what's going to occur because, um, you know, there are just very few A1s that would suit the purpose or, or be say 410A like right. difficult, this, difficult issue. Yeah. yeah this, this chart, the, the, the first line there for residential and light commercial, tell me if I'm wrong, Ron, but January 1st, 2025, that means... Mm -hmm. On that date, um, you, you can't have a 410 new unit that you're selling in a distributor. Yeah, correct. correct. So you can sell it for service. Right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, not, not, but not uh, as a match you know, whole system. Yeah. That's right. You know, there's a very important statement to bring up in this that I think a lot of, especially technicians, have missed. You know, when we went through the HCFC phase out, we had replacement service gases in place for things like R22 in particular. Mm -hmm. We had a variety of service gases mm -hmm. that you could use as repair, as service gases for those equipment. Pull right. out the R22 and you had a replacement refrigerant that would work depending on your application. Mm -hmm. There is no SNAP approved refrigerants at the moment for R410A. So that's the importance mm -hmm. of understanding what this means. That means everything after January 1st, 2025, going into completed systems for installation, Mm -hmm. We'll no longer have R410A, and there is no R410A service gas for the existing systems. Yep. So mm -hmm. almost all of our equipment will be going over to our A2Ls so that we can utilize a, the refrigerant that we are recovering for service gases of 410A existing yeah, 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 Cliff, I'm sure people are wondering why. Yeah. Why, yeah. why? Exactly. We've always had replacements. What's going on here? And uh, what has happened is 410A was, was adopted by the air conditioning industry because it's a higher pressure refrigerant yeah. versus R22 or 134A. Um, what that means is the components were smaller. Sure. If you ever, if you ever replaced yep. an R22 unit with a 410 unit, uh, residential, you, you know, compressor is tiny compared to the R22. Sure. And that was a good thing as far as the cost of the units go. Um, but it's also true from a chemistry standpoint that making a high pressure refrigerant, low GWP, um, it's not flammable is not something that anybody has figured out how to do. It's chemistry. It's yeah. Yeah. Dynamics, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, I'm glad you brought it up Clifton on the other replacements. It was fairly straightforward, right? Replacing R22 and say air conditioning refrigeration, right? Uh, we can formulate R32, 
uh, which is a flammable. But if we if we can put 125 into it to match the flammability, we put 134 into it to bring the pressure down, and uh, and 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 then you end up having a a refrigerant that in most cases matches the performance of our 22. That's been the history, right? Every yeah. time there's been a step change, you know, we we can work things around. But this one's all of the, yeah, and all of these new uh, low GWP molecules for the most part are lower pressure molecules. So okay. to try to uh, do something for 10A like, and they're not only low pressure, but they also pick up flammability. So if you don't have a good flame suppressor, then you have to migrate to a uh, mildly flammable, which is, which is where everything is going. Absolutely. And so the important part coming off from this is understanding that we are making a lot of transitions in a short period of time, and it will affect everyone, whether you're in residential, commercial, or industrial, you mm -hmm. are going to see some changes, but we are here to help prepare you for that. That's why mm -hmm. we have our knowledge partners here with us to talk about these transitions, to make it comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. Here's a good one. <laughs> Here's a good one. So <laughs> under the current under the current industry uh, changes, uh, you cannot install or sell. And we're, we're using residential here sure. as an example, right? Uh, as of January 1st, 2025. And you can manufacture, import, and install for service or repair indefinitely. That's the way it sits right now. The industry is pushing back on this, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and on, on the top end of it there, um, they're looking, the industry is pushing hard for a sell through to take it out at least a year, right? right. Which would be fair, I think. And, uh, uh, whether the EPA comes around to that thought, you know, we, we don't know. Um, and You're then, talking about 410A here. It doesn't really say yeah. that the left boxes. You cannot yeah. install or sell a new 410A system. That's um, correct. Thanks, Doug. Yeah. Yeah. Four ten eight. Real quick and say anything over a 700 GWP at this point. So it it, yeah. That's it. And this yeah. is a finalized rule as it stands. As Ron pointed out, it is finalized, published in the Federal Register. There is that, a sell through for package systems, but not for these split systems that we're looking at. That's yeah. exactly right. And uh, and then the second uh, after the industry is pushing back on this, uh, um, you know, this import, right? Uh, they really don't want it to happen. There, there's a lot of a lot of things that could occur. Uh, Pre-charge 410A equipment coming into the country. All all types of things that. Uh, uh, and you know they could get installed in a new, you know, into new um, rather than being used for service. So yeah. it, it, it's a conflict that um, the industry is trying to resolve with the EPA. So more to come on that. And there's a few things that we'll have more to come on. But that's why we're here. We're here to talk yeah. about the things that are current right. at the moment. Right. They can right. be different so, tomorrow. Yeah. So in this slide is tomorrow. Um, this is a good lead-in. Go. <laughs> so we, we've talked about things that are already uh, on the books, right? Yeah. And and here's some proposed. Uh, uh, ideas uh, from the EPA. Again, these are proposed. They're the common period is is upon us. Sure. Um, but they they're looking to change the um, uh, you know leak leak repair requirements and mm -hmm. and uh, and recording and uh, and units that have a charge greater than fifteen. And reclaim. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. And reclaim right. Um, and a GWP of fifty three. We're not certain why they pick fifty three. Interesting. But it, but it's yeah, it's an interesting number. But it's basically everything, and we had a conversation yeah. before the show kicked off that this could fall into some of the residential things. Um, you know, contractors would be required to, you know, to follow follow suit. Another one is the um, uh, on reclaim uh, refrigerant. It, it'll have no more than fifteen percent virgin, which seems okay to some, right? If you think about it. But you go to the next line, uh, starting in the twenty eight. All factory charge equipment specific must must use reclaimed refrigerant, and service and repair must use reclaimed refrigerant. So there's a little bit of a conflict there because uh, we're wondering where this reclaim is going to come from. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I come from the supermarket <laughs> industry, and I know I just think about one supermarket. Just take one supermarket. Sure. And it's leaking 15, 20 percent, whatever it is. It's gone. Right. There's no reclaimed. Non reclaimable. It's, you know what I mean? If you look at it, just a micro example, mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know where they think they're going to get this from. Um, mm -hmm. But they are, I think they're re-looking at, at the numbers here, but uh, sure. this is a starting point. And it yeah. is open for comment. And so we do have a link for that. And we'll try to see if I can find that and get that shared. But we've also had mm -hmm. some additional articles on this that have mm -hmm. the links for the public comments. But remember, if you do go onto the public comments and create a comment, 
that you will be on the register and it will be a publicly available comment. So let's be professional yeah. and be prepared for any comments that we would make for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's, there's a few other, I just, one other point I wanted to make yeah. here, there's a few other complications there. Um, not only is there going to be enough reclaim, but if you start looking at new products, when are they going to be reclaimed? Right. You're, you're, you're looking out into the future Years when, down the road, all, down, down the road. So all this is happening. Sure. Um, did did and, we have the cylinder thing on there too, Ron? Was yeah, yeah, I was going to touch on that. We, yeah, you go Clifton's, up, Clifton's, yeah. Clifton's pushing the pace. Oh, I missed on that one. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> one other thing I wanted. That's, that's to, a minor uh, thing. You know? Just yeah. a minor thing. Maybe minor. maybe this was intentional. <laughs> They're also proposing that um, uh, disposable cylinders uh, now cannot be disposed of in typical fashion. Uh, you need to send them back to a reclaimer to remove the heel, and then they'll deal with the. Uh, recovering the refrigerant and, you know, scrapping, scrapping the metal. Um, this is an offshoot of something that they tried to push through on everything being a, a returnable cylinder a couple of years right. ago, right? There was legislation that, uh, I'm sorry, a court action uh, that didn't go their way. So this is a, a way for them to do that. This uh, brings up a, a, another thought about tracking, right? How are you going to yeah. manage this? Um, is, are we going to have to put a barcode on a cylinder? Uh, we ship it to a wholesaler. Is he going to have to receive it? Uh, does he go to a contractor? Does he have to then scan a barcode? End user? I mean, you know, from start to finish, uh, I see difficulty in such a system and so many players, but that may be something that's tied into here as well. Again, this yeah. is proposed, right. but we'll uh, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, we, we have trouble getting 100 pounders back. I mean, sure. much less. Easier. You're right. You're right. We've got we've got $500 deposits on 100-pound cylinders. We can't get them back to fill them. Sure. Absolutely. Jason, I've seen a lot of comments about this and I'm sure we'll see a lot more. Remember, you have till December 18th for the final comments on that. And then we'll see more from Clifton, the I did send you forward. the link for that. Oh, OK. Let me yeah, see it's a comment. A right. OK. Mm -hmm. So why are we going to A2Ls? Let's talk a little bit about this. Sure. I'm um, not going to go through everything on this slide, but we talked earlier when Clifton brought up, you know, we're going to replace R22. Right. So we formulate some some refrigerant, we put it together and we can make an A1 nice replacement. A lot of people will say they weren't great because they had glide, you know, that sort of thing. But we're able to duplicate the performance of a lot of the refrigerants that were in place. And we're still doing it, right? Sure. For example, 448 and 449, replacing, you know, things like uh, 404, 507, um, you know, R22, sure. and, and, you know, taking the GWP down. But when we try to mimic things like 410A and some of these other refrigerants, I already touched on it, right? The lack of a higher pressure flame suppressant, you need to have reasonable boiling point temperatures for all of these things to keep Definitely. the glide, you know, at some reasonable mm -hmm. level and, uh, and have a, yeah, and have a good workable refrigerant. So all that being said, and the fact that the uh, low uh, GWP molecules are lower pressure, um, you know, and they pick up flammability as, as making us into this step change. So, uh, we've accepted the fact that we're going to pick up some mild flammability, mm -hmm. uh, hence the A2L rating, and some good solutions are, are, are coming out. Uh, we already talked about 454B, going to be a nice replacement uh, for 410. Looks like that's going to be the most common. Sure. And in refrigeration, a couple of blends, uh, 454C, 455. They uh, they perform like uh, refrigerants like 404, and we'll talk about them a little bit, little bit later. But um, they fit the, the equipment, so to speak, that's already been designed, right? So sure. not a lot of major retrofitting of right, the right. design not, of the equipment. Exactly. Not mm -hmm. a lot of redesign on the part of the OEMs. Again, that's been how we've gone about things. And um, it, it, you know, similar heat transfer surface, similar compressor displacements, right? Um, and in the in the case of uh, 454B, minimal glide, which is, is, is similar to 410A, a nice. little bit higher, but yeah. you can ignore it just about. I uh, shouldn't say that probably. Right. And then you get into the refrigerant, you get into the, the re commercial refrigeration aspect of it and uh, um, a little bit more glide in some of these, but uh, good performers. Uh, so there are solutions. We just have to be aware of what an A2L is. Yeah. And that's, that's, really why, what... they're, that's why they're here. Yeah, yeah exactly. So we're going to see a lot of them and we're going to need to understand what A2L looks like. Because a lot of times when people think of flammability, they think if something lights, then it's flammable. Yeah. Right. But that's not really so. So let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. Yeah, I could talk about the chart. I'm sure everybody's probably seen this chart before, but uh, 
A1s is what most of us are used, for, used to, 410A, 448A. There's a new refrigerant, 471A. Um, all A1s, basically no flame propagation. It's what we're used to. And then a couple of years back, ASHRAE started a new category called A2L for lower flammability. Um, and it's just a step above A1s, right? But it is, it will produce a flame. And then way up at the top, you've got A3s like propane. And when you think of something being flammable, you're thinking about propane. Yep. Um, and Ron's going to show, uh, Clifton's going to show some of the videos here, the difference between an A3, which is the top video, and an A2L, which is the, uh, the YF one there. So uh, mm -hmm. any comments there, Ron, before we roll? Yeah, it just, just that my comment is that you look at a chart and it doesn't mean all that much. I mean, they're numbers, they're numbers on a chart, right? What does it look like? So, yeah, yeah so we're talking about LFL and, and yeah. clean speed and, you know. Yeah, yeah, ignition energy and all those types of things. So years ago, we ran some experiments, and this is not a treatise on, you know, one refrigerant being better than the other. It's just, it's just these are just experiments, and it's demonstrating in an enclosed space uh, really the difference between, say, an A3 and an A2L. Um, so go ahead, Clifton, sure. and you, you can run the, uh, the hydrocarbon. This is just a domestic refrigerator. Um, 55 grams. 55 yeah, 55 grams, 55 grams uh, in an Not enclosed much. refrigerator. And then there was a, a little ignition source, a little sparker, like a, I think it was a fan power or something for the unit, sure. uh, and it, like a simulated spark inside. So okay. go ahead and we can see the effect. Clifton. Yeah, and I think it's very important to, um, to, to let everyone know, because we do get these questions and comments, uh, actually more comments than questions, that there is no propane. There is no isobutane in our A2L refrigerants that we're right. utilizing in this new Everybody equipment. take that home, tell 10 people, and let them yeah. 10 people tell yeah. 10 more people, because that's... Yep. That's something we got to get across. That's mm -hmm. the biggest one. So when we do this with the A3, remember, <clears throat> this is not refrigerants that are going into residential commercial applications as replacements for our A1s. This is a highly flammable A3 refrigerant. And then we'll show you the second one, which will be our A2L refrigerants that we will be using. So, yeah, let's take a look here. All right. And so if we can go back and look at that in slow motion, we'll see that we're introducing these 55 grams of a highly flammable refrigerant. This is um, R600, which is ISO, R600A, which is isobutane. Mm -hmm. So 55 grams of that in a very confined space with a high energy ignition can produce, uh, you know, quite the combustion. But when we start talking about our A2L refrigerants, let's take this same style presentation and let's now utilize our A2L and let's see what we do with our 1234YF with twice as much. Now this looks, like, this looks like a loop, but it's not. This is a continuous right. feed. Well, actually, right. see some changes. The refrigerator is leaking, mm -hmm. creating a spark and you can see there it goes. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. And you you are you are inside the uh the refrigerator here, which we had to put the camera in because we could not get an external effect, right? Exactly. Yeah, you, look at, you can look at the door when the flame yeah. goes, it just barely moves. See that? Right. Yeah, that's a magnetic gasket on the door. Sure. So so this is a, uh, you know, an HFO, A2L. And actually, Doug, correct me if I'm wrong, but this actually has a fairly low LFL compared to some of the other refrigerants. Yeah, you could say it's more flammable than the 454B that we're using for air conditioning. Yeah, yeah, based on, based on the data, right. All right, so, so that's good examples to show us, you know, what we're talking about. When we start talking mm -hmm. about the differences between A1, A2L, and A3, it's very significant differences in our A2Ls and our A3s. Absolutely. All right. Let's um, talk a little bit about classifications. and Yeah, yeah, well, well, just wanted to put this up because no matter what part of the industry you're in now, Contractor, wholesaler, uh, with A2Ls, uh, whether you're you're a warehouse person, you're going to need to know some of this terminology comes out exactly. of Ashby Standard 34. And we've been talking about LFL, right? Uh, but there's some of the other, like, refrigeration concentration limit, exposure limits, which if, if you're a factory, um, you know, and you're exposed to refrigerant on a daily basis, that could be your tech, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, for the sake of this presentation, we're really talking a lot about LFL. And that's got a bearing on on charge sizes. We'll discuss that coming up. It is not going to be uniform. 
from one refrigerant to the next. Exactly. It'll be based on a formula and the LFL. Mm -hmm. And uh, Doug will go into that, you know, in a yeah. little bit. So yeah, you just yeah, it's go ahead. To, it's important to realize that the LFL is a lower flame limit. Mm -hmm. So the higher the number, the better. Right. right? If the, if the number is infinity, it will never catch fire. Okay. If, if the number is super low, it can catch fire with with almost no energy at all, right? Mm -hmm. or, or no no very little volume in the air. Right. Um, so that's why that's used for for charge them, as we'll see in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Super. All right. So let's talk about A two Ls coming into the marketplace. Like we've said a few times, we're going to be seeing them in residential, commercial, industrial. Everyone is going to see it. And remember, hang around here in about another 24 minutes or so. We'll release that code so that you'll have access to the ESCO A two L low GWP safety training module. Getting close. All right. So let's uh, let's dive into our marketplace and see what are we going to be recognizing? Sure. What can we be preparing for? Yeah, you bet. So if you if you look at all of these. Uh, components or you could call them segments on the left hand side it's probably everything that this industry is really dealing with sure and uh, current refrigerants with their with their current high gwp solutions and if we look on the right um there are solutions and most of them are going to be a2l depending on the application there will be a, a couple of a1s in there but for the most part if we're trying to mimic performance of of existing uh, solutions, then we are going to pick up A2L. And you can see by this, uh, uh, everything from, from industrial, uh, the commercial chillers, we're going to be into the, uh, into the A2L. Uh, we haven't really talked about a refrigerant called, you know, 1234 ZE on this, but mm -hmm. it's already a refrigerant that, uh, it's an A2L, mm -hmm. um, and it's been out in chillers a lot in Europe. They're coming to yeah. this country. Um, it's a, got a GWP of one, right? So, um, and, and then 12, uh, uh, 33 ZD, a GWP of one that happens to be a very low pressure refrigerant. Um, really good solutions. GWPs of one, very efficient. So yeah. we're already, we're already there, you yeah. know, on some of these segments, yet. right? Let me, let me speak to the ZD there and the, in the chillers, cause we talked sure. about low pressure and I always had trouble understanding what that meant. So ZD can be used in chillers for, um, for air conditioning, um, but it's low pressure. And what it, what that means is if you took a bottle of that refrigerant liquid in a 60 degree room, it stays liquid. It's not gonna boil. That's a low pressure refrigerant. And that's why in a centrifugal chiller, it's actually running in a vacuum to get cold enough mm -hmm. to make cold air, right? Mm -hmm. um, cold water. Cold water, sorry. Cold water. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. But yes, yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, the point really is there are some really good, very low GWP, you know, solutions here, and and some of them, you know, happen to be the A two L. Yep. Good, a good number of them, right? In yep. every segment, you're going to see it. Yep. Everyone's going to be getting comfortable with A two Ls in a very yep. short period of time if you're not already. You bet. Um, so talk a little bit about commercialization. What do we need to go through to bring these uh, into the marketplace? Jason, yeah, bring it home. Yeah, Jason's not, nodding his head over there. He's real familiar with this stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, UL uh, standard is uh, is in place, um, but but Doug, perhaps you should talk to this slide. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no problem. Two dash eighty nine is for uh, commercial refrigeration, and two dash forty is for HVAC equipment, and this is. This is for commercial equipment. You don't necessarily need it for industrial. Right. It's for commercial equipment that the, the public is is uh, in contact with, um, and and it's got a lot of I've got a lot of rules in there to make the A two L safe, and and mm -hmm. it is in, it is in flux right now. Mm -hmm. um, now the UL standard is is um, a safety standard for the equipment in general, and the ASHRAE standard fifteen is more for installation standards, right? And I'll, I, I'll say it now because I could say it on the next slide, but the, the ASHRAE 15 is what you'll see in the in the local codes, like the Uniform Mechanical Code and International Code. Right. Um, and what, what ASHRAE 15 does, it just says, yeah, you can use an A2L for a listed piece of equipment in commercial. And what that means is it's got to be UL listed. U UL listed, sure. Um, so they, they are, the, the two standards are, are harmonized in that standard, in that, in that fashion. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you get you get through those standards and they get it written and done and um, manufacturers can build equipment to the standard, et cetera. 
Uh, but before we can go much further, uh, a refrigerant not only has to have its safety classification, you know, done by ASHRAE standard 34, mm -hmm. but then you have to, in the United States, you have to go through the U S EPA snap process. Right. Um, and typically, and we have a typical timeline up until this has all occurred. And, um, you know, the AMAC, uh, it was a long process yeah, absolutely. Uh, to bring, to bring things, right. You take, uh, uh, you go through, as we already discussed, the industry standards, and then it would find its way into the uh, the building codes and then filter itself all the way down to the local state codes, jurisdictions yeah, that become commonplace. A long period your, of time. If you go to your city that you live in and you look up the codes for that city, almost for sure it's going to be an older code that doesn't include the H-Wells as a separate category. Absolutely almost right. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. And, and it may be six to eight years old, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Right? Exactly. So that's so that's the current process, and I and I laid it out. It could take up to eight years or whatever. That's what it used to be. So now, and now we're in the uh, expedited. Now we're into now we're into the. We have to go really fast because we've got these hard targets uh, and timelines in place. So sure, uh, a lot of these states um, are are skipping some of the traditional way of getting it done, and they are passing legislation uh, to allow a two Ls. So, yeah, there's two ways for that to happen. They can update their building codes, which is a committee process, or they can do it legislatively, like you said. That's right, and uh, and and there's a lot of environmental pressure, you know, out there, and, and a lot of people with that interest. So, uh, uh, some are opting for the leg legislation process, which is fine. Um, however, when you get down to the local building code, if the legislation pad, they may not update it. Uh, you could still have some issues if you're trying to put something in the field. Um, we can help. Um, we, we've got you know people on the ground, but that's the way it appears to be going in a lot of the states. Yeah, um, I mean, I, more I, to I come. Live, I live in Texas, and I and I and they've done the legislation. And I said, this has got to be a crazy legislation. It's got to be you know 100 pages long. I pulled it up, and it's literally like two sentences. It says, "Hey, right. if it's snap approved, use it." Basically, wow. that's what it says. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, right. So very important to know the state and potentially your local jurisdictions. And we'll see a lot more of that going forward as we're mm -hmm. you know, preparing for these yeah. transitions. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So as we said earlier, not all A2Ls are going to be the same. And Doug, Doug will lay out, you know, at least one aspect of that. Right. From a charge. Yeah. This is a busy slide. Charge limits is, is um, contentious. This is a show yeah. right here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, See how I can go about this. We talked about ASHRAE. ASHRAE limits the volume, uh, limits the charge by the volume of your room. And, and basically, if you do the math, you can you can use a lot of refrigerant. But right. then it refers to UL and says so it has to be UL approved. Well, UL uses the LFL, the lower flame limit, and you can see it on the the top uh, table on the right. You can see we've been talking about 454B. Mm -hmm. The LFL is. Uh, 0.352 kilograms per meter cubed. So there's 0.352 kilograms in every meter cubed. That's how much you have to have in the air for it to be able to ignite. Okay, right? sure. And so UL, at least right now for refrigeration, this is this might change. Um, right now they have this M1, mass one, mass two, and mass three. And each one of those masses has mitigation measures. Mm -hmm. Right, so M1 is 13 times LFL. So you can see on the set chart on the on the bottom there for 454B, M1 is about 10 pounds, right? So like Jason said earlier, that's most residential uh, air conditioners. So M1 mass and below, 10 pounds and below, there's very little you have to do with an A2L, right? There's installation regulations, but there's no leak detection, there's no valves, things of that nature, right? As you go higher to M2 and then M3, what you have to do to make it safe with an A2L increases. And I'll give examples here that, that may change, but uh, like for a supermarket, let's say with uh, 455A, if you get to the M3 charge, you get like 240 pounds in the system. You're going to have to have valves around the evaporator or the, the, the display case. You're going to have lead detection in the case that fires those. Um, things of that nature. For uh, walk-in coolers, you might need uh, constant ventilation when you get a leak. In extreme cases, you might need to vent it out of the cooler, right? Sure. So there's a lot of these different things going on. Um, and, and the interesting thing for the contractors online is a lot of this is going to be on you to read the manual and make sure you're not putting 
too big of a coil and too small of a room um, that you've got all these valves installed and things of that nature. Um, I don't think you're going to have to know the UL codes. The, right. the manufacturers are going to have to do the very installation nice. manuals and tables and charts, and you'll be able to follow it. And I think in a couple of years, it's going to be business as usual, but uh, it's going to be a lot. I'd like to throw in there, yeah. too, that there are a vari- um, quite a few uh, companies working on apps for this as well, mm-hmm. uh, based on yeah. cubic volume for charge size. So there'll be a lot of apps that can be downloaded to, to do this. Um, and the other thing is that in most applications, residential, like when we look at how the code qualifies that well, this is a residential, this is a mm-hmm. industrial, this is commercial. In, in a residential setting, you're not allowed to use the M3 charge limit. M2 is yeah. your max. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you're not allowed to use greater than M3. That, I mean, that's it. Yeah, period. In right. any application, correct. Yeah. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. So I tell everyone, as long as you're reading your installation manuals like you're supposed to, this is all going to be included in your new installation manuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk a little bit about transportation and uh, storage. And remember, everyone here, just uh, about 13 more minutes, we'll release that code Mm -hmm. so you'll have access to the ESCO Mm -hmm. A2L OGWP safety training course. Sure. Uh, Just a little bit on servicing. And there's nothing on this slide. It's a busy slide, but there's nothing on here that that us techs, you know, sh- shouldn't have been skipping or so to speak. You sh- right. should have all have been, best you know, doing this, you know, best practice work right along. And sure. it, it's a good evacuation, recovery. Uh, the only thing I would like to point out, um, we all know that, you know, the refrigerants are soluble in oil, right? Um, and you, you pull an initial vacuum. Um, you did not pull all that, you know, unless it was a very deep vacuum, you could still have, you know, residual refrigerant and lubricant, right? That's the job of the lubricant refrigeration system, allow it to mix and travel. Um, so, so really uh, pulling good vacuums. Uh, there's, there may be some mandates about, uh, pulling the discharge of your vacuum pump away from you, maybe even outdoors. I've heard some uh, localities looking at that. Um, but, uh, a, a couple other things. Uh, in servicing, uh, stick with the original OEM uh, components, right? Motors, yeah, don't stop it, something else. They're, they're building something to a UL standard, so you cannot you cannot go around that. Uh, tools certified for use with the A2Ls must be used. I'm talking about recovery units, that sort of thing. Yep. Uh, there, that is all being developed as as we speak. Um, and again, Doug, Doug already touched on the charge sizes, so uh, do not think you can swap one A2L in for another, even if they're close cousins. They're going to have different LFLs, so you really need to stick to the original. And as yeah, far- I mean, that's that's a good point. If you put if you have a system with 250 pounds refrigeration with 455A, and you swap that out for 454C, now you're over the charge limit. That's correct. Mm, that's an interesting yeah. point. That's correct. So it's going to be really important to uh, provide um, you know documentation on installations. We should have been doing it right along. I mean, some are better than others. In the manual, right? You know, in the manual and then on the commercial refrigeration, you know, tag the equipment. When was it serviced? What did you do? How much refrigerant did you put in? What refrigerant? What lubricant? All that sort of thing. Uh, I think it's going to get more formalized, formalized as we go forward. Yeah. At least it should. The, the good news, though, is that the as far as how it works, thermodynamically, you know, superheat, all those things, these are very close to what you're used to. Mm-hmm. You bet. And, we're, and for those that are joining us for the first time, you know, this is what we talk about every week. We bring in different knowledge partners from the industry. So keep coming back. We'll be spending a lot of time with other knowledge partners from the industry, especially tool manufacturers that are going to be talking about their tools. What ones are A2L certified and compliant? We're going to be going over best practices and procedures for installations. Mm-hmm. And we want you to join us. We'll be hanging out with our good friends from Honeywell at the National HVACR Education Conference, March 25th through the 27th in Las Vegas. And we'll have a lot of people talking about, you know, tools, equipment, yeah. installation. We'll have manufacturers there. We'll have a lot of classes diving even deeper into this. I know both you guys are going to be with us, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to be there. And actually, that, that show has really grown over the years. It's, oh, it's, yeah. It really it's has. Lot, it's really good now, yeah. Lots Plus, and I want to throw this specials. out there real quick. Yeah. There's a lot of comments coming up about superheat and subcooling. Can oh, I yeah. st- Listen. Just because the refrigerant is flammable doesn't mean the refrigeration cycle changes. Superheat yeah, is still super changes. Heat, subcooling is still subcooling. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good point, JC. That that is a nice feature of the A2Ls from a thermodynamic standpoint and a servicing standpoint. Other than the safety aspect, they, they should be very similar to what you've been doing in the past. 
if, so, if 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 a residential unit is put out with a subcooling chart, you know, for for setting the unit up, it'll it'll be almost not identical, but it'll be the very similar procedures. Yeah. And not, Jason, a, not a lot of difference. No, Jason covers a lot of this in the A2L safety program that we're going to be giving you access to here in a little bit. And for those of you that are educators and you're looking for additional resources for the classroom, uh, Jason also has a full low GWP curriculum available for you as well. So lots of resources going forward when we get into working with these A2L equipments. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about some of the valving. We have had some questions on this too. Sure, um, this is this is this is, yeah, this is a guideline, right? Um, uh, this is I can't really see. I think it was guideline M, but uh, uh, by HRI, and it's listing the the valves we'll need to use on our cylinders. Okay. And if if you look at the center, uh, they'll be left-handed valves, right? Uh, depending on on the size, the small all A two Ls. All A2Ls will be left-handed okay. uh, connections on the cylinders, um, even you know all the way up until our, our hundred pounders and large thousand-pound cylinders. Uh, okay. So we are we are adopting uh, the HRI recommendations. At least Honeywell is. Excellent. Right. So the new tool um, you may need is an adapter from a left-handed thread to a right-handed thread. Exactly right, and I, I know that a couple, at least two of the companies have already produced them. Right. Yes, so they are be, out there. They are out there. So if you're thinking, well, I've got. And we can go on to the next slide because most yeah. of the equipment is going to maintain right-handed, uh, and for most of the equipment, one-quarter-inch male flares, right? So your cylinder is going to be left-handed, but you're going to be conventional on the equipment. Uh, makes it easy. You get an adapter for the A2L cylinder. It seems a little odd to me that that's the way it's gone. Uh, and the only thing that the manufacturers, at least most of them, that I've talked to, this is the direction they're going to go. Mm -hmm. Again, this was a guideline, and they're just going to paint the uh, – uh, the connection point red, right? Okay. It'll be standard quarter inch uh, male flare. Uh, pretty easy to connect up your conventional hoses. So nothing different There's on no the equipment. There's no functional difference order. in a left hand thread and a right hand thread. It doesn't change how a tank works. Right. The right. Color coding. All of this is to raise awareness that hey, there's something a little something different, different about this. There's something different in this tank. There's something different. In, again, it just raises awareness. It doesn't change the functionality of anything. That's absolutely, absolutely correct. Um, Transporting, boy, there's mm. a lot of there's a lot of discussion. <laughs> there's uh, another show <laughs> going around, and and basically, you know, according to DOT, you know, you need to transport these refrigerants as you would any flammable gas. Yeah. Now there's uh, a lot of discussion going around about uh, bullet point three here, and initially, um, everything must be transported in an upright position. That's what we know today. We believe this could be in flux, but we cannot say anything different as of as of this minute. There may be some some reprieve on that. So at this point, everything needs to be in an upright vertical position. And I know that's a lot of angst for uh, technicians out there. You've got those torpedo launcher types uh, uh, for your for disposable cylinders, and uh, they may not uh, may pass muster. But uh, hold on to that, and we'll see where this we'll see where this goes. I know um, my old service vans, I had plenty of spare vertical cylinder storage because I had so many refrigerants on the yeah. van. So they've been yeah. around for a very long time. And mm -hmm. most of our distributors are already carrying A2L refrigerant cylinders. So mm -hmm. things like, you know, 32, 454, these are common refrigerants that are out there in the field right now. So just yep. because you're not familiar and comfortable with A2Ls doesn't mean that they're already not out in the supply chain because they absolutely are, especially yep. the equipment. They absolutely are. So there's, uh, you know, and the basic stuff from DOT, placarding, you know, yeah. uh, uh, extinguisher, you know, that that sort of thing. Uh, you should have a, a written a manifest of what you're transporting, you know, uh, that sort of thing. But um, uh, not not a lot different. And we already touched on the fact that um, even these cylinders may have to go back if mm -hmm. they're disposable. But uh, again, this is still in flux a little bit right. and uh, more to come in the very near future. And we will have the EPA uh, as a presence at the National HVACR Education Conference. So um, mm -hmm. come join us and hang out and let's be professionals and, and right. learn from, from the top mm -hmm. down what these things sure. look like for us. Uh, one thing on that last slide that I didn't touch on, and that is uh, reclaim cylinders for A2Ls. Oh, yeah. Um, it is not, as, as far as I know, <laughs> completed uh, from my digging into it. Uh, guideline K is being revised uh, to cover both A1 and A2Ls. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing that uh, they may run a different connection on the uh, on that uh, A2L container. Um, 
but we'll we'll see what they come up with and then uh, how it's adopted. Okay. I can't imagine you, you you would use the same and just rely on a tag between A1 and A2L, but we'll see where it goes. Right. Now, refrigerant storage, um, there is a lot of uh, anecdotal things flying around on this. Jason, I'll probably, you know, ask for your help here. Um, there, There is some work that's been done in, I think, 2022, right? Wasn't it the NFPA uh, had, had published something on some uh, 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 requirements and, and the possibility of uh, maximum uh, allowable yes. storage? So the 2024 IFC has been updated for mm -hmm. A2L cylinder storage. Yep. Uh, having said that, based on the maps that we saw earlier, um, don't just assume that your state has already adopted the 2024 IFC. You're going to have to check with the local codes, right. but Verify locally. they are in the 2024 IFC and the amounts differ very based on the occupancy classification of the structure. Yep. Are you a wholesaler storage? Um, do mm -hmm. you have sprinklers or fire suppression, um, room alarms, uh, active monitors, those sorts of things. So depending on, uh, again, your local code, number one, and two, the building requirements and classifications, it will vary what your MAQ or your maximum allowable quantity is for storage of A2Ls. Right. And even how you store it. Right. Right. On or racks just, or pallets or, rack right. or pallets or what your, you know, what your method is. And uh, it, kind of similar to what Doug was talking about charge sizes, right? Volume is going to come into play, the type of uh, occupancy, that sort of thing. So uh, we can only go high level here. Um, so we've, we've, we've listed who you really should be talking to, um, but it's evolving. And to give you an idea though, it's, um, uh, it, it's not small amounts. I mean, if you're a wholesaler, there's a good possibility, you know, you, you could have 20,000 pounds of an A2L, you know, in your back room, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but again, uh, follow up, um, you know, with your AHJ, you know, for guidance on this and uh, don't rely on a lot of the things that, uh, that are flying around on the internet and the rest of it. Some people are saying you, your maximum is a thousand pounds or right. you need to build a special, uh, uh, you know, building walls, et cetera. Sprinklers, right. Just to give you an idea, <clears throat> the MAQ that's currently stated in the 2024 IFC for sprinklered and non-sprinklered for if you're a storage warehouse, non-sprinklered mm -hmm. is about 20,000 pounds. But if you do have a sprinkler and again, storage warehouse, it's about 40,000 pounds. Yeah, right. That's a lot. right. Again, that's we're a lot. allowed by local code, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think before we dive into um, all of the Honeywell A2L refrigerants, I think we're close enough now. We'll go ahead and launch that code so that everyone that is joining us today has access to the low GWP refrigerant safety flammable and mild flammable refrigerant course brought to you by the ESCO Institute. This is a $39.95 product that we sell all the time that Honeywell is sponsoring for you as a bonus for hanging out with us today. So I'll leave that one up. That one will be there on the side. And we'll also put that in the chat and I'll bring that into a couple different places so that as you're continuing to join us, you can get this resource and have it downloaded and join us as we continue learning about these new A2L refrigerants. All right, let's look at some of the re commercial refrigeration side of things. Yeah, we'll, we'll jump into that. And we're just going to keep this to, you know, three refrigerants we'll talk about today. I'd already mentioned ZE and some of the others. Um, but uh, commercial refrigeration, uh, we're offering 455 and 454C, uh, you know, and I'm speaking North America, you know, at this mm -hmm. point in time. And I really can't see the slide. It's, okay, uh, let me pull this out. That'll stay in the background for people. Hold on just a second. Right. I'll bring that right up for us. Mm -hmm. But I just did want to talk a little bit about, about the performance, right? Um, both under, you know, they're both under the 150 GWP. Um, GWP, uh, really, we use 404 here as a, as a mm -hmm. baseline. All right, performance, just to give you an idea. Um, doesn't really have capacity listed, but compressor displacement is a really good indicator. Uh, so 404 system, 100%. Uh, you can look how close these uh, uh, these are, a little bit less uh, uh, displacement needed for 455, so a little bit more capacity, a little bit, a little bit more displacement at 454C, right? So a little bit lower, um, but really good uh, uh, performance, actually improved performance over 404. Um, and again, Doug had made the point earlier, why would you choose between either one? It, it may come down to the allowable charge size, 
right? right? You Absolutely. see the difference between sense. between these two refrigerants, and depending on your application, you're doing a walk-in cooler, you know, may or may not have an issue. But if you want to use the maximum, and you're doing supermarket work and say a distributed system, um, you know, you may want to maximize the refrigerant uh, charge so you can you know pick up more of the load. So there's some there's some differences there. Uh, you can see the glide uh, on these refrigerants. That's evaporator glide, a little higher on, on 455. Mm -hmm. We all love glide yeah. refrigerants, I say. Tongue, tongue in cheek. We're all you have to know what experts. you're doing there. We're all experts in dealing with it now. Uh, equipment manufacturers and coil manufacturers are are finally got their you know their their hands around it. So sure. um, not the mystery that it used to be. Um, mm -hmm. But again, just be aware of it. Honeywell is going to be providing these uh, these two refrigerants, and uh, uh, you can see on the bottom of the chart, 25 pound non-returnables, 100 pound cylinders, half tons, and ton cylinders. And I had already talked about the connections that uh, we're standardizing on uh, bulk cylinders, uh, that sort of thing. It's a little in flux on how that's going to be valved, but um, two really good replacements, compliant, gets you compliant under the 150, real workable, uh, and very similar in performance to say, you know, four and, four and others. And almost positive these will be um, dual rated units when you buy a unit. Like right now, you'll have four, yep. four and five or seven. Awesome. It's going to be the same. The same. Yeah. Game. Yeah. Yeah. We, we believe that to be true. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And uh, again, 454B, we've talked a lot about it uh, today. Yeah. Um, you know, GWP is compliant, uh, you know, under 500. It needs to be under 700. So very good. A2L. Um, very similar performance to uh, we'll see it on the next slide uh, to 410A, uh, so a really good job of uh, matching up here. Um, again, uh, anywhere 410A was used, I think you're going to find this. Uh, chillers, obviously residential, light commercial, heat pumps. Uh, it's it's making its way in. All the OEMs are building around it at this point in time. Um, package sizes, uh, conventional. Um, you can see what we're supplying there. And the, it'll be a little different here. It'll be 20 pound uh, disposable jugs on the oh, uh, 454B. Okay. Sure. 25 on those others, 20 on, 20 on this. I think that's um, that's pretty typical in the industry, what, we've, what we're seeing. Yeah, so we've seen a lot of that. A lot of use. A lot of that use. has to do with the, people may not know, that has to do with the density of the refrigerant. Uh, oh, okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and how much we can put into that conventional cylinder. It's the same range. amount of volume. It's just some refrigerants. The are weight. Yeah. yeah, and I'll also point out that these cylinders don't have rupture discs; they have pressure relief valves on them as well. So that's a great point, Jason. Mm -hmm. they, people were asking, "Can I store this in my van?" Well, if you're mm -hmm. storing four ten A in your van, you can store this in your van as well. The pressures, temperatures are similar, and it yep. doesn't have the same rupture disc where everything goes. Uh, it does mm -hmm. have the spring loaded PRV to just yep. and bring the pressure back down. Just gonna yep. burp. Yeah. Yep, just gonna burp. Uh, here, here's a little bit of performance on the. Uh, you know, 454B, there's the makeup, 1234YF, which we showed you in the uh, the video, right? That we had a tough time getting the light. And uh, R32, there's the blend. Uh, and you can see the performance, real real similar to uh, mm -hmm. uh, 410A. I'll point out the glide is you know, in the evaporator, like 1.8 degrees. If that's very similar to, say, if you're used to working with 404, most people ignored the glide. Yeah, exactly. Didn't even know right? it was there. A lot of people don't know there's there. glide in 410A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is. Yeah. It's minimal, but there absolutely was some glide in 410A. Sure. Yeah, it almost yeah, made it as, as an azeotrope uh, mm -hmm. way back when, but uh, not quite. Um, mm -hmm. but, interesting, uh, interesting thing here, the 454B, you see the composition, R32 and uh, YF. YF is what you have in your automobile, almost certainly. Mm -hmm. And so... 410 is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ron, 32 and R125. Yeah, 50 50. It's just, just a matter of sw swapping out one very low GWP refrigerant with a high mm -hmm. GWP. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. And picking up, uh, you lost the flame suppression, so you picked up a little bit of flame yeah. miller. And right. 454C, for those that don't know, mm -hmm. 454C has the same components, different percentages. That's the only That's difference. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, man, that's a lot of stuff. And look at us. We're right there around that one hour mark. We actually did really good. I, I didn't know if we'd get through all of them or not because so many of those slides could be an entire show just yeah. on those individual pieces. Sure so we still could. have a lot of people out here in our community. We thank you all so much for joining us. We've already got a couple hundred people that have downloaded our QR. We'll leave that up while we're here. We got a few things that we can talk about. One of them that I want to talk about also, I'll bring up a separate QR for that one, is with Honeywell. We have a variety of resources. One of those 
is our Honeywell um, Solstice A2L refrigerant site. So we want to get more information on the Solstice line of products, which are our A2Ls. Here is a access for that one, as well as the Honeywell refrigerant resources. So when we start diving into additional resources from Honeywell on all of these transitional refrigerants, that's a great resource for you to hop in there. Yeah, with. Quick, quick note on that. That is the back to cool. It's I think it's 10 or 12 different all the way from history refrigeration all the way up yes. to, you know, uh, uh, thermodynamics. Good stuff. Only thing I'll say is just skip the uh, the uh, one on regs because it's six months old. So it's, oh, well, we, we've seen how yeah. much that changes. That's a new yeah. weekly item to keep up with. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you that um, are potentially new to ESCO, if you're just joining us for a first time, we'd love to connect with you. This is a community that we have here. So you can check us out at escogroup.org. That is our call center number, 1-800-726-9696. What about with Honeywell? So I see we have some resources here. Are there any other sites that we would like to connect people with? Well, at this point, we're using, you know, what, what you can see there is a focal point for a lot of our A2L information, but mm -hmm. that's growing daily, right? Uh, Doug just finished some tech service bulletins. Uh, they're going to be put up there uh, very soon. Um uh, we got a white paper at A2Ls. You know, kind of uh, goes a little bit more in depth on on the evolution of this, so that'll be available. Uh, so a lot more information, almost weekly, getting uh, added to that site. Sure, absolutely, a lot of things happening for us here. Yeah, you bet. Looks like a lot of people scanning the code. That's great. Yeah, we're doing yeah. good. We did have quite a few questions come up in the chat as well, so that was really good that people were. Um, <clears throat> interacting so to speak listening to the things that were being presented and had relevant questions to the content yep. being presented it was really good yes yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if you didn't have a chance to tell us where you're joining in from please let us know we'd love to see how large our community is growing you gotta remember when we started just over a year ago it was jason and i hanging around going hello yep. Is anybody out there? Does yeah. anyone know that new refrigerants are coming, that equipment is changing? Will, will anyone even listen to us and look at us today? We had over 900 people registered just on LinkedIn alone to mm -hmm. participate. And so mm -hmm. you, even that number that shows up there with 125 watching, that we find that those numbers actually don't indicate exactly what's happening in our community. Because we can already see it says 125, but yet 322 people have scanned the QR. So <laughs> yeah. <that's> yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if we have a thousand people out here today joining. So this community is for you. It was built for you by the ESCO Institute and HVAC Excellence to prepare all of us for these changes and to just talk openly about it and be professional and not be negative. We're here to be positive and to grow. So when we talk about progressing in the world, those who educate are going to excel. And that's what we're here to do is we're here to bring our knowledge partners straight to you. And some questions, if anyone has some things that we feel like weren't covered that we want to learn a little bit more about, let us know. We'll see if we can continue to cover those as well. I just want to thank Honeywell for being here and doing this. This is a this is kind of a big deal. I mean, it's a really big deal, if you ask me, um, to come on here, to do this presentation, to sponsor this education. It's a it's an honor, actually. It's a it's a big deal. It's a support yeah. for the entire community. Yes. Glad to be here. Yeah, really glad to be here. We appreciate uh, working together. Very good. Excellent. All right. Wow. That's a lot of good stuff and a successful show. I only slipped on a few <laughs> words and my tongue only got tied a few times and only mm -hmm. a few Hoosierisms. So not bad at all. Doug, Ron, we are so grateful to have you here with us. And I you really look time. forward to hanging out at the National HVACR Education Conference with you guys and just doing more shows together. Like I said, I, I, I seen three or four slides in there that is a individual show. <laughs> yeah, a lot of information, you bet. Mm -hmm. All right, any last departing words from anyone? No, again, thank you. Appreciate the format is great. Um, yeah, know, it's, it, uh, it, it's really a, a pleasure to do it this way and uh, very interactive. And I, I, I was scanning a lot of the... Uh, uh, questions coming in. There's Howard. You bet, Howard. Yeah, glad, Howard. To, glad to do it. And um, uh, again, appreciate it and looking forward to doing some more with you. All for right. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we thank everyone for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next week. We're going to be hanging out with Chris Mahali next week again, diving into some ECM motors and 
keeping up with everything that is changing in our industry from not just refrigerant transitions, but technology transitions, equipment transitions. So there's a lot of things for us to talk about. And uh, if you have any things that you want specifically covered, let me know. See Beck at escogroup.org. And we will see you all again next week on Did You Know? The Esco HVAC Show. Take care. Bye, Thank guys. you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.